Steve McLean, it is a privilege to have you here in our studios today. Thank you for coming in. Yeah, it's it's great to be here. It's a, it's a great day for uh, David Saint-Jacques, and uh, I look forward to watching the rest of his race. Well, well, indeed, this is a very special occasion. Uh, when you, you, of course, have been in this situation and also in the uh, a bit more administrative uh, position as well, mm-hmm. guiding these, these astronauts from the Canadian Space Agency, what was your feeling when you first saw the image of uh, David Saint Jacques outside the capsule? No, I was just uh, I was just so happy for him because it's it's a complex uh, set of activities that he's going to be engaged in. It's incredibly uh, technical and detailed, and it requires a, a extreme focus, if you like. And but with all the training, there's there's excellence. The teams that train you are excellent. Uh, there's excellence in the training. Uh, the, the training is so high fidelity that uh, when you get on, up on orbit, uh, except for the fact that you're in space, it feels like uh, a training mission. And of course, the fact that you're in space is a big difference, but uh, you're still executing it like that. But you never know how you're going to be because you've never done it before until you leave the airlock. And so after you see, like, he just needs to be out there for a few minutes and you can tell he's comfortable. Uh, and uh, then I, I was so happy for him because uh, it meant he was going to have a, an, an incredible adventure during the next seven hours. What about this aspect of, of when you actually go through the airlock? What is that like for you when you when that thing opened and you stuck your head out? Like, wh- what's the feeling that goes through that? Well, you know, uh, if you look at the airlock, it's kind of pointing down towards the Earth. Uh, but when you're in space, there's no up or down. And so from your point of view, you can control what you want. If you want to feel like you're going down towards the earth, you can feel like that. If you want to feel like you're coming out, up out of something, you can make yourself uh, uh, feel like that. But there is such a big difference from being inside the station to being outside the station. First, inside the station, you're protected by all the structure that is there. When you look out the window, uh, it's not that it's 2D, but you always see the peripheral of a window. You always see a frame of something. When you get out on a spacewalk, you put your nose on the face, your faceplate, you have no peripheral blocking at all. So it's almost as if your eyes are, and your peripheral vision is seeing the entire Earth or the entire universe uh, all at once. So when you go from being inside the airlock to being outside the airlock, you go through that transition. And for me, the immediate response was, whoa, we look so much higher than we do from inside. And uh, I think it's just that uh, it's, it's just physics. It's just an effect of the peripheral vision that you have and what you can see. Well, t- so, tell me about this up and down aspect, because that seems to be, we are, historically, we know mm-hmm. where down is. Oh, we have millions of years uh, evolving in a 1G environment. Yeah. And then after, you know, getting into orbit takes eight and a half minutes, or 12, 12 depending on... Uh, the scenario, but let's say eight and a half minutes, you're in zero gravity uh, when the main engines cut off. 45 minutes later, you're doing another burn to circularize your orbit around the Earth. You're in zero gravity. There is no up or down. And at the beginning, you, you're you so comfortable with having a down that you use the reference of the shuttle, the floor of the shuttle as you're down, or the reference of the space station. You know, there is there is, you know that in one orientation, the space station, the Earth is underneath you, so you use that as down. But just after you know, 24 to 48 hours, you stop using that reference, and you end up, your frames of reference, your reference points become quite local because you end up, imagine you know, if my head was down here, you start using different things for a reference. And, and this is what happens on a, on a spacewalk. You can imagine that you're, if you're... Um, translating across the truss, you can imagine that the entire space station is underneath you and you're translating above it. Or you instantly can flip it so that you're underneath the space station translating it underneath it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one may be more comfortable for an astronaut compared to the other. And so you you choose the the reference frame that you want for every particular task. And uh, in my case, I found that wherever my head was was up and uh, this was very comfortable. Now, of course, uh, <clears throat> there is no small amount of danger to these space. Yeah, it is risky. Yes, but of course, you have a whole bunch of training for this. I, yeah, I once... and and experience too. There's yeah. there's years of experience now with uh, and all the different lessons learned, and s- sometimes a, a lesson a lesson learned is something that uh, happened that was minor on a previous mission, but you could see how if you 
combine that with something else, it could become major. And so we're just getting very much better at it with each. This is EVA 54, I think, for the space station right now. And uh, we are getting better at it, but it is still risky. Uh, you know, there, there are still... There are still sharp edges on the space station. I mean, when it goes up there, it's quite smooth, but with a few micrometeorite hits, it ends up having sharp edges that might cut your glove. You continually check your gloves to make sure that you haven't uh, ripped an outer layer. Um, we have something that's called total tether consciousness, mm -hmm. but it's not just the tethers. You kind of imagine your entire body and where it is relative to the space station, and you are just extremely careful, extremely focused, and you move with precision. Uh, you don't do anything, uh, anything well, quickly, well, and it, it's all to kind of mitigate a uh, possible chain of, of events that could cause a risk. I, I once heard a phrase: uh, "Don't do, don't practice something until you get it right. Practice it until you can't get it wrong." Yes. Is, is that? Yeah, the, it's very. Um, I mean, this is it's almost a mantra. Uh, we, uh, my commander said to me when I exited the airlock, uh, "Trust your training," and. Uh, these were quite comforting words because uh, what it tells you is if you just do exactly like your training, you're going to be okay. So don't don't try to do something new. Uh, and of course, if something new happens, you have to react to it and respond, and there'll be interaction with the ground about how to handle a particular event. But uh, yeah, I think uh, they're trusting your training and doing it exactly like you did in training. These are things that are very important to think about. It is because of the risk. It is something how focused you can stay. Uh, it's almost you're, you're working, you're at your work site, you're, you're stabilized, you have a body restraint tether that can stabilize you, or maybe you're in a portable foot restraint that stabilizes you. So you're working at your, in your work site, you're, you're predicting. It's like you have a secondary observer watching what you're doing so that you anticipate what's going to happen in the future. If you're, if you're moving a, a, you know, you're driving a wrench or something like that, like you imagine what would happen if you slipped. And so you make sure if you slip, your, your slip motion isn't going to cause another problem because you hit something else. Uh, of course, you don't slip because you're very focused. But it's the, the amount of focus, the amount of precision when you do, do these tasks, uh, and you maintain that for seven hours. I was out there for seven hours and ten minutes, and I was entirely focused for seven hours and ten minutes. But there's something also that's interesting is that uh, in between heartbeats, kind of, you look up at the universe, mm -hmm. and, of course, a second feels like an hour, and, uh, and then you go back to work. And this, this concept of time, it blows me away, actually, mm -hmm. because you're, you're focused on a task, but then you look up, and you might, you might see, um, you know, the air glow, or a, a particular constellation, depending where you are in, in your orbit, and you just, wow. Mm. And then your heart starts beating again, and then <laughs> you keep working. Like Time really expands when no. you're on an adventure like that. Yeah, of course, part of the training is, is you've mentioned this before, other astronauts uh, have mentioned this before, about training in the pool. Yeah, the pool is phenomenal. Uh, yeah. With, with a, an exact mock-up of the station. But that's not the same movements it's not the same feeling as, as when you're in yeah, space. Yeah, they are. You know, they're very, it's very good, but it is different. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, the water that's in the pool provides a drag, and obviously the drag is practically zero uh, on orbit. But you know, on orbit, you, if you move too fast, you'll get out of control. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you move slowly... And delicately, And right? delicately, incredibly delicately, and it, it is something to... Like I can imagine, you know, you're just touching to control yourself on orbit. You're not working hard. It's just a touch uh, for all the different rotations. And, uh, and yeah, as long as you move slowly, the pool simulates what happens on orbit very, very well. If you try to move fast, it takes a lot of effort in the pool to move fast. If you try to move fast on orbit, you'll be out of control before you know it. So you, you, and that's dangerous. And that's dangerous, so you yeah. can't do that. So the pool ends up being a good simulator when you keep it within its parameters of, of moving slowly. Now, so, I've also watched you moving your arms around to demonstrate certain things. But, in fact, that's not exactly how you move with that spacesuit, right? That's true. That's true. Um, 
And in fact, I noticed that when I first, the, my very first day, I thought, wow, this, this is like inverse kinematics on a canid arm, on a robotic arm, because there are joints, like there's two joints in the shoulders, they're kind of uh, annular joints, and then there's, there's one in the elbow. And you have to, you know, you don't have a full degree of freedom shoulder, you, you can bend the elbow, and then the wrist, you do have roll uh, in, the, in the wrist, but it doesn't work like the arm, it works more like a robotic arm. So you can imagine if I try to go against that annular joint and work at 90 degrees to it, it's not going to move very well. So for example, if you lift your elbow first and then come up, it's following, it's minimizing the amount of torque that's required on the arm. And so by, by doing that motion where you, you just want to, you just want to raise your hand from here down low to two feet higher. Well, on earth here, we just raise it like this, but in a spacesuit, you'll lift your elbow first and then do that. And sure. that minimizes the torque on the arm and reduces the re strength required from your shoulders when you do it like that. And so it really is true. You, you, after working through all the different motions that you have to do on orbit, you become one with the suit. And it's, it's like a different exoskeleton compared to uh, what you've used for the first 40 or 50 years of your life. Now, again, David Saint-Jacques is out there now. Um, you have said before that you can never, ever forget those feelings. Just, yeah. just get back into that just for a moment to, to sort of take well, us that, back to the situation. That's why this, this day is so special, is in that Dave Williams um, did his record-breaking EVAs 12 years ago. My EVA was 13 years ago, and I think Chris's EVA, EVA was about 18 years ago. So we come here today, we're watching uh, David's uh, uh, EVA on uh, NASA TV, and what I find amazing is even though mine is 13 years ago, I can snap right back into when I was there, and you remember every single detail. And, you know, it's impressive to me because what, what it means is that when you're on an adventure like that, it, it's not just ingrained in your memory, it's coded into your memory. And you can retrieve it at any time uh, that you want. And I find, you know, your whole life's not like that. Uh, there are, you know, episodes in your life that you, you maybe some episodes you're glad you don't remember. <laughs> but, but there are other episodes in your life where you don't remember all the details like that. And it's when you're on such an adventure like David is, is uh, having today that uh, it becomes coded into, into your mindset. Steve McLean, thank you so much for coming in today. Okay, thank you. It's been a pleasure.